friends who are graphic designers, do you draw the pictures? I just, you know, paint them essentially, it, paint by numbers on the screen. So, uh, but that's that, that's my old life. So I, I still occasionally do freelance projects. But um, I, I founded, uh, co-founded a, a, a design company here in Sacramento, CDK Creative. And in January of 2016, I relinquished my uh, role in the company to my partner and uh, took over, well, I had previously, six months before that, taken over uh, sole responsibility of two uh, two-year-old girls. Well, they're two now. At the time they were, six months when I took over. Um, so my twin daughters are kind of what I do. My wife works uh, three doors down from here. She's got the good job with the benefits. And, you know, I had to, <laughs> I was self-employed, so that wasn't a, that wasn't a, a real hard decision to make. But in addition to being a stay-at-home dad, as I mentioned, I do some free uh, freelance uh, web design still. Um, I do some creative writing still. Uh, I used to blog extensively, probably hundreds of thousands of words of mine out on the web somewhere. Some of them I'm embarrassed by now, some of them I'll still stand by. Um, I also uh, am an actor and a director in a local community theater here. And so you, you see a thread, right? There's yeah, each and every one of those endeavors requires creativity, requires uh, being able to tap into that, uh, piece of our minds that helps us to problem solve in a way that isn't, that, that doesn't come with a, a manual, that doesn't come with an outline. So uh, I, I was in a show a couple of months ago uh, called Peter and the Star Catcher, and every night I heard one of the other characters, happens to be the villain in the, in the show, uh, make a declaration. He wanted to uh, write a poem to commemorate his uh, getting one up on my character, taking over my ship. He was a pirate. Um, and the, the, the line that he said every night is that he was going to plug into the muse. And it stuck with me. I, I, I'd never heard that before. I'd never heard the idea of being able to plug into the muse because you guys are familiar with the idea of the muse, right? The, the, the nine Greek goddesses um, who... Uh, the daughters of, of Zeus and, and Nemesine, or Nem Nemesine, I don't know how I don't know how to pronounce that, but they uh, weren't they weren't something traditionally that you could plug into. They weren't an on-demand service. You couldn't go to the news and say, "Hey, I need some inspiration. Come on, uh, move this along. I've got a deadline to meet." <laughs> right? The the muses were the the inspiration that they gave was at their whim. It was at their pleasure. And so the idea of tapping into the muse was kind of interesting to me. In fact, uh, writers in ancient Greece uh, would invoke the muses at the beginning of their uh, epic poems. Right at the beginning of the Odyssey, uh, Homer says, Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. And so invoking that muse to help tell the story was also an indication that he was going to write this in an established form, that it was going to be an epic uh, poem. The Enid, um, Enid, that it's that A.E. throws me off. Yeah. Uh, o Muse, the causes and the crimes relate, what goddess was provoked and whence her hate, for what offense the queen of heaven began to persecute so brave, so just a man. So again, Virgil invoking the muse, trying to ensure that that spirit of inspiration would stay with him throughout the telling of this tale. Uh, and that was kind of the way that you did it. People would make offerings to the muse, but there was never a time when somebody would go to the temple and say, where's that? Where's my inspiration? I need it now, again, because I have a deadline. So quick uh, poll of the room. Um, who does what? Maybe quick introduction so that I know who I'm talking to. Uh, Brian and I. Well, currently right now I'm doing landscape, but on the side I'm trying to get into uh, like t-shirt designs. Oh, great, perfect. Landscape. I have a brother or ex-brother-in-law who uh, was a landscape designer. Really lucrative career when the construction industry is doing well. Uh, I'm Brittany Murren. I do animation for a myriad of companies, Cartoon Network, ILM. Um, Very cool. 
small indie companies and I help at risk youth. Very good. Okay. Uh, Bill Trinette is a graphic designer, printmaker. Okay. And an engraver. So I'm kind of, uh, kind of in love with analog right now. Awesome. We're doing my printing press as opposed to my laptop. Very cool. Analog is great, right? Um, Kevin Trevady. I teach our uh, graphic design and web design classes here. Okay. And, and I'm an artist doing landscape. Very cool. Renee, I'm a digital project manager with Capital Public Radio. Okay. And then uh, history and art and at home. Kind of thing. Very cool. Uh, I'm Thomas. I'm a graphic design student here at the moment in, in my second to last quarter. And I also work for a, a nonprofit, small nonprofit named Davis. Okay. Uh, my name is Mike Villacat, and I do a mix of uh, graphic design, web uh, site design for a, uh, a state department. Okay, very cool. And yeah, Michael McDonald, I have an advertising and, and marketing agency, so one man shop, so I do it all. Very cool. And uh, Liz, you? I pretty much do what Mike does. I'm a mix of graphic design and web. Okay, yeah, for the state. Yeah. Yes, for the state even. All right, very cool. So all of you. Uh, work in, in fields that require creativity on a deadline. And that's traditionally, <laughs> that's not something that artists had to deal with, right? When, when, when Michelangelo was uh, commissioned to paint the Sistine Chapel, and it took him, I can never remember, a decade? It was like a really, but there was no deadline, right? People would come and bug him and say, are we done yet? We're kind of, we're over budget, but you know, how long is this going to take? And he'd say, um, I don't know, you know, waiting for the muse, waiting for the muse, waiting for that inspiration to, to come. And so this is a relatively new phenomenon that as creatives, as, as people who work in the arts, that we run up against deadlines. Uh, as a writer, if you're a professional writer of any sort, a freelance journalist, what have you, those deadlines are... <laughs> <laughs> they're killer. They're absolutely killer. Uh, Douglas Adams is my favorite uh, favorite quote about uh, Dilbert. deadlines. Hmm? Uh, Douglas Adams, um, the other guy, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he said, "I love deadlines. I love the sound they make as they whiz past my ear." <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's you know you say that oh that's a writer, but for unfortunately, and if you're not Douglas Adams, most writers can't afford to do that. You have to meet deadlines so you get your next paid project because if you develop a reputation for uh, <clears throat> not meeting your deadlines <laughs> people don't pay you for things anymore so the, the 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 way around that of course is to do what i did and write uh, write for a uh, trade magazine for a sales column five monthly sales column for about 12 years in a trade magazine never got paid so nobody could complain when the articles were late <laughs> It still did, but um, so there's there's that. So uh, so how do you, how do you as creatives find inspiration? You've got a looming deadline, and the closer that deadline gets, the greater the pressure, and so the more um, difficult it can be sometimes to find that inspiration. What do you do? How, how do you find your inspiration? Google image search. Google too. <laughs> Start. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, when I was coming here for usually a great kind of last minute, then, like force myself to do it. Pressure. Yeah, yeah pressure. pressure. So like having that pressure. Yeah. Anyone else? I you, listen to a lot of podcasts. Podcasts are a great way to go. Yeah. You, if you're designing for something for somebody, you have to, to talk to people in that area and then yeah. um, make conversation. And then also, I. I do some journaling, so I, I just write, force myself to write, you know, page after page until <clears throat> you start to kind of assemble your thoughts. Yeah. Focus. It's, it's also the privilege. Yeah. Uh, Two-step process. One is I think of what is it that I need to get across in concepts, and then I start sketching on paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's what my business partner, he was, uh, he was our graphic designer um, would carry around his, his sketch pad, just pencil and paper everywhere that he went. Even though we were a digital agency, that was kind of his, you know, he had a lot of means. Mm -hmm. A fun way to go. And did you? Um, well, I, I just kind of immersed myself in a project and then I 
usually it's just go for a long walk and hope, hope things yeah. kind of come down. And that's that's really where a lot of us end up mm-hmm. is in the hope stage, right? We've got a deadline coming. We we uh, know that we have a project that needs to be finished. Um, we may have a self-imposed deadline. We may have a, a project that we're working on personally, and so we wait and we hope and we hope and hope and hope that eventually the muses will bless us with inspiration. They'll give us some kind of an idea or a seed of an idea that we can work from and, uh, and, and, and bring forth whatever this new creation is. But we can't do it on command for the most part. It's not something that we, we're not in the habit of thinking that way, of being able to do it on demand. And so that's what was so intriguing to me about this line. Every night, over and over again, plug into the muse. I'm going to plug into the muse. I'll plug into the muse. And it, it, it started to kind of drive me crazy. So I did a quick Google search. It's really the only place where it's mentioned. This, this phrase, plug into the muse. There's one other guy uh, who's a professor at a university in like Ohio who does agriculture um, studies of some sort. You wouldn't think that's really a creative endeavor, but of course, problem solving, if, if, if what you're doing has any kind of problem, problem solving component, of course, creativity comes into the, into the mix there. And so he's the only other person, aside from this play, that uses that phrase, uh, plugging into the muse, as far as Google is concerned. <laughs> there, there may be more people now. Hopefully, we're going to start a trend, and we'll, we'll We'll all be talking about plugging into the muse. Um, so we think about inspiration, though, as something that comes from outside. Of course, the Greeks embodied that in goddesses. Um, we talk about we, we've kind of uh, bastardized the the term. We call uh, you know our girlfriend is our muse, or our boyfriend is our muse, or you know um, the band Muse is my muse. I, you, <laughs> you 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 can have. All of these muses, but they're external to you. And that idea that we're relying on something external is another difficulty. In addition to having to wait now, not only are we having to wait, but we're having to wait on something external to us. And so I think it's really my belief that, that we can plug into the muse, that we can have that ability to tap into inspiration on demand but we, we have to go about it very methodically. It's, it's not something haphazard. And as creatives, speaking personally for myself, haphazard is um, kind of the way that I approach my work life. Right? There's uh, a, a tendency if when I'm involved in a creative endeavor to, to just kind of ah, let it go. It's, you know, it's art. It's not supposed to have any particular kind of form. Um, now, I'm not like that taking care of babies, because you can't be, right? If you're haphazard taking care of babies, everything falls apart by the end of the day. It doesn't even take like a week. It just, by the end of today, it's it's over. Um, but the, but then you go into a creative endeavor, and it's just kind of this ah, loosey-goosey, very, um, you know, experiential, I'm going to meditate my way through this, which is not a bad idea, but again, it's that idea of having a method of approach. Um, so we can we can kind of train that. Uh, so we're going to spend the rest of our time tonight discussing how we can go from being beholden to inspiration and, and kind of being its, its servant, being at, at inspiration's beck and call, uh, to kind of flipping the script and having inspiration, if not at our beck and call, at least in partnership with us, that, that, we, that we can at least... Do this together. It's not something we're not we're not waiting on that muse's schedule. And so we're, we're going to have four uh, topics that we're going to cover. And the first is to become a student of the creative process. And there's some real hard science behind the idea of the creative process. Uh, Leanna uh, Gabora, I think, is her name, um, is the research scientist who's kind of embodied this work, uh, the idea of the creative process. So if you have some time, um, the, the, the papers that she writes are really heady and, and very analytical, um, but really good information about 
especially for creatives, about how we can follow the, the process that leads to um, success in our creative endeavors. Uh, so then we're going to then we're going to go into what happens if the creative process gets stuck, right? So the creative process has a series of steps that we're going to walk through, but what happens when those steps aren't working? Then we've got three topics that we're going to discuss about when the creative process isn't working. Uh, the first is to think inside the box. Second is to disrupt your routine. Third is, I just called this one, is the night time the right time? Right? Because I'm a music lover, so we'll kind of define what that means. And so again, that first one is about cultivating the habits of creativity, and the other three are for what happens when we get stuck somewhere in the process. So uh, becoming a student of the creative process. Let's, um, real quickly, we're going to do some uh, first step is the preparation step. Um, preparation for a creative endeavor, wh what does that look like? I mean, what do you think that might look like? Research. Some, uh, you mentioned R&D, yeah. um, you mentioned immersing yourself and, and having conversations with, uh, with the people who are involved. I know when I was in web design, um, it was interviewing the, the client and, and asking a lot of questions about what was it that they were trying to achieve. Not, not necessarily, you know, what was their goal for how the website would look, but what, what were they trying to accomplish? What were the... What are the actions that they wanted to motivate clients who would visit their website to take? Uh, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's that idea that you're, again, immersing yourself in the domain of this particular creative endeavor. So some examples might be, if you're a musician, you're absorbing a lot of music. You're listening to a lot of music that's, that you're hoping will inspire some of that, you know, if you're going to write a piece and you know the genre of the piece that you're trying to write, it would be a good idea to immerse yourself in that genre of music to hopefully get some inspiration. And again, you might want to go outside the genre to look for some inspiration for having a new way to write in that particular genre. If you're a writer, I, my advice, everyone who ever says, I want to be a writer, my question is, how much do you read? Read obsessively. I, 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 at any given time, there are, um, it's harder to tell now that I have a Kindle, but it used to be on my nightstand, there would be three or four books, and, it, and you know, my ex-wife would ask, which one of those are you reading? Reading all of them. It depends on the moment that you catch me. But if you want to be a writer, you immerse yourself in reading other people's writing. It makes you better at what you do. Um, if you're an artist, you're looking at other artists' work in the area. If you're a scientist, you're doing your R&D. You're doing your background research. If you're an entrepreneur or a marketer, you're looking at all of the previous market research on what other companies have done to achieve whatever the goal is that you're trying to get to. So how do we do this? What, what does our preparation look like? Again, usually it's either looking at something or reading something, but we want to do it relatively un uninterrupted. We want to have some quiet time to be able to really absorb the material. Whether it's something that we're looking at, whether it's something that we're listening to, we don't want a lot of outside distraction because what we're doing, what we're doing is we're doing a dump into our brain, right? And and that is different than the typical beginning of a creative process, which is to do what? Brainstorm, right? And get all of the ideas out onto paper. Well, there's a step before that, and that's to get all of the ideas in, to get all of the information possible about what it is that you're trying to accomplish stuffed into your head. And then comes step two, which is the incubation process. Did you mention going for a, a walk? Yeah. Yeah. It, taking some time to let that information that you put into your head ruminate a little bit, to get uh, let it roll around and let it do its work on your unconscious mind. I mean, you know, what some people call the subconscious mind. That, there, that there's a level of activity happening in your brain that doesn't require the engagement of 
your, you know, you, the, the, your analytical mind. So just letting those ideas percolate, essentially. Um, all of that information that you gather during the preparation stage, you're just letting it turn. And so that second step is incubation. Now, incubation leads to Illumination, mm. what's, a, what, what's some called the insight uh, step, the, the aha moment. Um, it's that, it's when that, I, when all of that information that you've stuffed into your brain, you've let it percolate around and something bubbles up and it comes to the top. Uh, hopefully the cream rises to the top. Um, uh. But it, essentially the idea is that something is going to pop out of your this stew that you put into your head that's going to be a potential answer to the problem that you're trying to solve or the work that you're trying to do or the creation that you're trying to uh, invent. This, this is what most people consider inspiration, right? It's that, it's that moment of, that's a fantastic idea, right? When does that usually happen for you? When you don't expect it. When you don't expect it, right? In the shower, the driving, uh, sleeping, a lot, of, a lot of people have that moment wakes them out of a dead sleep. Um, and so you have to be prepared for it because I've had ideas wake me out of a dead sleep and then I've rolled over and gone right back to sleep and in the morning I can't remember what it was. Idea for a story or whatever it might have been. And that's the most frustrating thing. Same thing if you're in the car. Uh, and, and you're, you're driving, you're stuck in traffic, and suddenly the idea pops into your head. And what do you do? Ah, crap. Well, hopefully, you, you know, I can remember it. I have, uh, when I was um, completely different, uh, I wanted to be a motivational speaker. <laughs> hesitate to say that, but um, it's true. And so there were, I had a, a, a partner that I was uh, working with at the time, and he and I were, were writing a, a book and we were giving lectures and had a, a, just this aha moment of the perfect name for a perfect domain name for the company, or for, for this thing that we were trying to create. I can't remember what it was now because that's been you know, 10, 12 years ago. But in the moment, I was on my way to a concert and I didn't want to miss the opportunity because I know that once that, once that idea uh, uh, it manifests anywhere in the universe that you've got you're, you're on a you're on a limited time budget before somebody else because that the universe isn't stingy when it puts an idea out into you know the the ether <clears throat> everybody gets access to it so you got to be on your game I called my partner up and said hey I'm on my way to a concert but can you buy this domain name right now and fortunately he happened to be sitting next to his computer so be prepared for the illumination is kind of the point of that story. Um, if you're not prepared for it, you can miss the opportunity. You can let it go back into uh, incubation. And, and it's super easy to prepare, right? I mean, it's not carry a notepad and a pencil with you. Um, all of our phones have memo recording devices. All of our phones have video cameras if it's something to turn the camera on yourself and talk to yourself, send yourself a text message, um, anything to preserve that moment of illumination because, again, if you miss it, it can be hard to find. Um, so the, the, the problem between incubation and illumination is that you don't have control over when that idea percolates. And that can be frustrating. You know, a lot of the information that you read it says, oh, this can take days, it can take weeks, it can take months, it can take years. And if you're on a deadline, taking years isn't an option, right? Taking months might not be an option. So the more you can continue to prepare while you're incubating, the, the, sh the quicker you're going to get to that moment of incubation. Don't just do one dump into your brain and then wander around, you know, like an ascetic, Go out to drive out to the Mojave Desert and wander through the, until the, you know, the the idea percolates. Keep preparing, right? This isn't a 
this isn't a necessarily a linear process. Um, continue to put and immerse yourself in those situations. You can also do those things. You know, get get involved in those low physical, low level physical activities, um, and do something with your analytical mind. Do some math problems. I've always found it helpful to do crossword puzzles because it just engages that analytical part of your of mind and lets the unconscious take take over and and just do some high level functions that only it knows about and, and allow for that percolation to happen, allow for that illumination to happen. So then comes the fourth stage and the one Almost none of us. It, it, we have we we go two ways. We're either really terrible at this next step, or we're so good at it that the results are terrible. <laughs> and that is <clears throat> evaluation. Hmm. So idea percolates, percolates. Okay, great. Boom. Got the idea. Let's go build it. And we jump straight to the end of the process without this, this step of evaluation. Evaluation is our opportunity to catch any potential for mistakes, any potential dangers that might, uh, that this solution that we've come up with might um, throw our way. Uh, but, so, and so a lot of us are, we, we don't do it at all. We skip right from illumination to implementation, which is the fifth step. Oh, I gave it away. Spoiler alert. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and put it up here anyway. I'm an actor. Yep, you got it. <laughs> um, we we, we want to jump straight from illumination to implementation because we've got the idea. We want to strike while the iron's hot. And we want to get it done. But if we don't evaluate, we might be wasting time. So what does evaluation look like? Evaluation is the step where we stop and say, is this really the answer that I'm looking for? It's an answer, but is it the answer that I'm looking for? If we've got uh, multiple ideas that have percolated up in, in multiple ways that we can approach this problem, this is where we begin to eliminate, no, that's not really a good option. That's not really a good option. Let's start to maybe pursue these three and, and continue to narrow the field from there. But the other problem with evaluation is when we get too good at it. And when I, when I say too good at it, what do you think I mean? Paralysis by analysis. Exactly. Our, our self-critic, our inner critic takes over and just drives the ship straight onto the rocks. Because every idea that comes up we think, oh, this is the dumbest thing that anybody's ever, right? I, I can't believe, after all of these, after all of this preparation, after all of these weeks of wandering the desert, I can't believe this is the stupid idea that came up, right? We get so hard on ourselves that we just negate the opportunity to move forward into the implementation process. And so evaluation is really just a series of questions. Is this a practical solution? Is it a novel or new idea? Am I rehashing something that's been done before? If, if I'm rehashing something that's been done before, am I doing it in a, am I taking a different tack, a different angle? It, it does, it, does it have a different feel from the way people have, have done this in the past? It's also an opportunity to go to a group of trusted friends, underline the word trusted, because if you just ask, and, and also, Ask people who would actually know the answer. Don't spray Facebook with your, what do you think? Oh, God, please don't <laughs> spray Facebook with, don't ask your best friend from second grade, you know, in, unless unless he's or she has also, you know, pursued the same path and, and is a creative as well. But talk to a group of other creators. If you're in a classroom setting, that's a perfect opportunity. If you're in a peer group like this, it's a perfect opportunity to chat beforehand, chat after, and say, bring your stuff here. This is a great opportunity to turn to somebody sitting next to you and say, hey, here's the uh, the project that I'm working on, and 
here's what my brain gave me. What do you think about, does this seem like a reasonable approach? Does this seem like a good idea? Does this seem, um, you know, and, and get folks input. Ask both kinds of questions. Ask those open-ended questions. What do you think about this? But then also ask specific questions that, that you, you can say. Is this, is this something you've seen before? If so, is it different enough to be, you know, to be considered a, 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 a creative, or am I plagiarizing something? Am I unconsciously plagiarizing someone else's work? Have you uh, <clears throat> writing song lyrics um, is a death trap hmm. because you it's almost impossible to keep other people's song lyrics out of your head while you're writing song lyrics. It's just it, it, it's Right there, same for, you know, if you're writing blog posts or writing content for a book or whatever that might be. All of the words that you've ever read want to crowd in and, and you know, have their say. And so be careful about unconsciously plagiarizing. Is this something you've seen before? Have you read something like this before? Have you heard a song like this before? Whatever that might be. Um, I don't know what that next... I don't know what that next thing meant. I, I had an idea there and I wrote it and, and the words don't make sense. So I'm just <laughs> going to skip it. Um, so this is creative people. When, when you hear somebody described as a, a, a that person is so creative, all it means is that they're really good at allowing these ideas to percolate and then <clears throat> executing them until they get the one that's going to be the actual answer. Right? Or the one or two that are going to be the answers to those problems. Those are the creative types. It's just that they've got really good at this process. Now, um, uh, and, and they and they and they're good at it in this, but just enough, right? Just good enough at it to not step over into that paralysis of paralysis. So, our final stage: implementation, also called elaboration. This is uh, Thomas Edison's famous quote, right? Uh, 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 invention is 1% uh, inspiration and 99% perspiration. This is the 99% perspiration. This is where you do the work. This is where you flesh out your idea. And it's not just because who has ever had something happen here that that's exactly what the finished product Either. It <laughs> never has happened. This is sometimes completely unrecognizable by the time it's done, by the time you're done with it. Because during that implementation and elaboration process, you iterate. You draw the thing, you sketch, uh, you know, whatever the first idea is. And then you begin to modify and elaborate on the original idea or condense whatever the original idea was happens a lot with story writing or book writing that um, plot line that sounded just completely genius when it when it came to the illumination takes an unexpected turn during implementation and elaboration and and so you that's that's where most of the work is a lot of people think that this is where all of the work is this is where the magic happens well it's where some of the magic happens but without that Implementation and elaboration, it's just another idea. Right? It's, it's like my, my older brother, who could have been a millionaire, because in the 1980s, he suggested to my parents, he had a friend uh, who, um, whose dad uh, had a piece of property that, that happened to have a, an artesian well. If you're familiar with that, it was a big thing in Oregon, some mm -hmm. big pure water. Um, and his idea was, God, we should we should bottle that stuff and sell it. And all of, all of us are like, you idiot, who's going to buy? You get water out of a tap. Nobody's going to buy water from a, a bottle. What are you? And because he didn't implement, it was just a moment of illumination that could have made him a very wealthy man. So, <laughs> you know, he still has a little bit of bitterness and resentment over that. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Um, so testing the idea working on the idea, refining the idea, and finally coming to your finished product, right? So is this a new way of thinking about creativity? 
for, for anyone, or is this kind of the process that you guys, you, you kind of already have? We have a class here called Concept Design. Uh -huh. Thomas, do you remember that class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, this kind of feels like, it's very similar. Sometimes it's five ses, steps, sometimes it's six or seven, uh -huh. but it feels like the design process we're kind of talking about. Yeah, and, and it's a great way to work. And, and whenever I get stuck on something, I, I go back and I ask myself, am I, am I following the process? Am I, have I done my preparation? Have I allowed myself some time to incubate? Did an idea come up that I, that I didn't catch, I wasn't prepared to catch? Um, have I, have I self-criticized myself? Have I talked myself out of doing something that might actually work? Am I, this one, man, <laughs> that's the, that's the bugger. Because you get to a point where you're like, so tired of staring at the same project, right? Like, especially in web design. Oh, oh God. God. <laughs> but projects that drag on for months and months and months, and you're like, I just want it to be over. Can we be done yet? And then you take it back to the client, and they have, oh, well, hey, that's great. That's really fantastic. That last round of changes, man, that's really brought us exactly almost to where we need to be. <laughs> you need almost. Get your check from Right. And here this other, Here here's this again. other cook to the recipe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, well, I showed it to, have you guys seen that, that graphic? It's like a, um, an infographic about, uh, oh, no, no, was it an oatmeal cartoon about um, design and, and the design process? It's really funny. And I think it was an oatmeal cartoon. Is that but it, like it, the 3D production pipeline? Uh, it wasn't. Yeah, it might be it. That it's might the one be it. Where they're, they're, making, they're making an animation for a client. Uh -huh. They're doing it, and it's like it's a rabbit or something, right? Yeah. They go through the animation, the production, the entire thing. They get to the end. They show it to the client. The client's like, could you make that a rabbit? Yeah, let me get that done in two days. Everybody? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing where the clients are the most frustrating part of the job. If you can, <laughs> if you can be a creep without clients, you know, that's really where it's at. Um, because they have ideas. Uh, most of their ideas are dumb, <laughs> but they're the ones with the money, so what are you going to do? Um, so, we have a process. If we remember to do the process, a lot of times that gets us to where we need to be. But not always. Sometimes we work in the process and we get stuck right here. You know, there's, we, 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 we meet that impenetrable barrier. That we can't get from incubation to illumination. We just the ideas are not coming. And so how do we fix that? How do we get past those barricades, those blockades to our creativity? How do we force that inspiration? I can't believe I've been talking for 45 minutes. Rock um, on. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna have to move at a faster clip to finish this. The first thing that you can do is to think inside the box. Who is familiar with the classic nine dot puzzle? And connecting yeah. with four lines? Four lines. Only four lines. The first time I saw this, I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. who, who knows the solution? Anyone know the solution? Yeah? Where do I start? Uh, start here. Below, on the left side. Left side. Below. Below. The last dot. Yes. Draw straight up to the first dot. Straight up this way? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go from there directly right beyond the next dot, that last dot. Diagonally? Go to the right. Or... Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, let's see. I'm going to show you the, 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 the condensed this? version. That, that I, this is the one that, that I looked up. And I did look this up. I had this question on a job interview, and I didn't get it at the job interview. And so I went back and I Googled it and came up with a solution. And I sent the guy who interviewed me the article. I said, this is how I solve problems. I, I'm not going <laughs> to sit here for the next 20 years and try to figure out that. Ah, it's it's <laughs> one of the two no, dot angles. Right, right here. There you go. Boom. Yeah. So dumb. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it just, it, it's, it's just such a... But the point was, his point was, think outside the box. And this, is, this became the, 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 the catchphrase. 
of the 90s and the, and the aughts, right? Think outside the box. Innovate, innovate, innovate. And while that is, while it has its place, and it's an excellent way to get things done, sometimes the opposite is the actual way to move yourself forward in the process, to deliberately put some constraints on what you're trying to do. Um, Lego did this in 2004. They had a retooling of their supply chain because they, although they were the largest toy manufacturer in the world, they were losing money. It, 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 it seemed like this impossible thing that we can't make money on products that, A, the greatest brand name recognition, recognition in toys, right? Everybody in the world knows what Lego is. To the, it, where, to the point where they did that thing where Band-Aid, you know, became synonymous. Band-Aid is a brand, but it came, became synonymous for, for bandage. Lego was the same thing. Any block that you could connect to another became a Lego, right? Even if it was Duplo, or Duplo was made by Lego, but any, any of those. Mm -hmm. Mega blocks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Legos. Um, so what do you think the problem was? It was that thinking outside the box. Every time their toy makers came up with a new set, what did they do? All of those new sets required new pieces. Mm. And if you're in the plastic injection molding business, which is what Lego is, Lego is a plastic injection molder at its heart, right? The end result happens to be cool things that kids like to play with. But if you're in the injection molding business, manufacturing and supply chain are the keys to your business, creating efficiencies in those. So if I, as a toy designer, come up with a pirate toy set that has 10 different pirates with 20 different leg configurations, with different patterns painted on those legs in different colors that we haven't used before, I have shot our profit to shit. <laughs> it's gone. Um, and so they found this over and over again that they were creating new sets, new pieces, and losing money, and completely losing control of their supply chain. And so what did they do? They went back to their toy makers and they limited the amount of new pieces, new individual piece designs that could be in a given set and required their toy makers to go back to the drawing board, back to the classic sets and use more of the pieces that they already manufactured. And that, that was the key to their profit around, was putting those constraints in place. Now you might think, well, that's going to kill innovation in toy making. It doesn't. It actually has the opposite effect. When you put in well-defined, well thought out, well planned constraints, they can actually enhance the process of innovation. Think about Iron Chef. Any Iron Chef fans? I love that show. <laughs> Alton Brown. The, 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 I can't remember. <laughs> I was a fan of the Japanese, the Japanese one, yeah, oh, too. Yeah, so Iron Chef, Iron Chef America. The the trick to that show was the secret ingredient, right? It was the constraint. It wasn't just are you a great cook, but it's are you good enough that if I throw octopus at you and you have to make a dessert with it, can you do it? And those kind of constraints drive creativity. They drive innovation because you. It, you're on that pressure, high pressure deadline. You're waiting till the till yeah. the last. You know, I mean, they're under they're under an immediate time constraint as well, and it forces your brain to do some really cool magic. Also, forces your brain to do some really stupid things that fail. But <laughs> the point is, you're, you're you're moving forward in the process. You're you're getting yourself past that illumination uh, barricade. And so, how can you do that as a creator? Um, some of the suggestions, uh, instead of staring at a blank canvas, draw five random lines on it. Set a constraint. You have to use these five random lines, but better yet, have somebody else draw them for you. Right? Have somebody come over and just draw them. And you have to incorporate those into uh, the, the, the thing that you're creating. Um, what I was blogging regularly, I would invariably I would I would write the title first. Something that I thought was a really 
the eye-catching title, and then it would write that. Write the article that goes with that instead of, you know, writing the title of the article. Other times when I was really stuck, I would just throw it out. I, I would do exactly that. I would throw it out to the Facebook universe and say, hey, what do you want to read about? And force myself to write one of the one of the prompts that came back. It's the writing prompts are a great way to get creative. Um, in acting, actors make a ton of bad choices. And so if you're the director, you have to put constraints on the choices that they make. Because if you just say, well, just cultivate this character, you you can end up with some really awful ideas. But you as a director have to constrain those and say, okay, here are the parameters within which you can create um, the backstory for your character. So thinking inside the box, forcing yourself to have some kind of constraints is one of the ways that you can push yourself forward in the process. The second is disrupting your routine. Um, think about your morning routine. What are some of the things that you do during your morning routine? Make First. coffee. <laughs> every day, my friend, every day. Brush my teeth. Brush teeth. Pat the dog. <laughs> Brush teeth. Feed the cat. Feed cat. I make breakfast every day. Work out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of these things you can think of as macros, right? Um, these are things that run on autopilot. Making coffee is something I don't even have to open my eyes. I know where the coffee pot is. I have a process for cleaning out the French press from the day before, grinding my beans, getting everything ready. And I don't think all I think I'm doing is making coffee. But there are 